All right, hi everyone. Welcome to Mindgasms. Going to talk with Peter Salmon today, um, author of the new Derrida biography called An Event Perhaps. I haven't read that yet, but I am in interested to read that and maybe we could talk about that at some point That's as well. Strange. Shall I do uh, the author thing where I actually hold up the book? Thank yes, you. yes. An Thank event you. perhaps. There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, good. I'm really, like I said, I'm really glad that you're uh, talking with me. I uh, uh, wanted to talk mostly about, uh, like, like I said before we started, we're going to talk mm -hmm. mostly about uh, that article you sent me. Um, and I'll, I'll share a link for that in the description of this video as well um, sure. that you wrote about how Foucault and Derrida are the most misunderstood philosophers of our time and about how they didn't even like each other and they weren't they weren't relativists and they rejected the label postmodernists and you know like uh public intellectuals all the time get them wrong in the public yeah. eye like people like jordan peterson and members of the intellectual dark web and i know in your article you yes. mentioned that book cynical theories by james Lindsay and helen Pluckrose that came out recently too so yes. yeah so yeah it'd be, it'd be uh, great to get into that with you and and then also for people watching who don't know who you are uh, explain who you are there too i know Bob. Uh, just on a side note there before you get into that i saw um recently jordan peterson was talking with stephen fry and i saw that stephen fry mentioned your book and he said hey you should oh, read you? this maybe it'll see maybe it'll change your mind about derrida and foucault a bit i i actually didn't know that i'll have to is that clip available i have to find that that'd be yeah, really it's, on, nice. it's on uh it's on youtube on jordan peterson's channel he did a, right, a okay. with Stephen fry about that yeah fantastic oh that's that's really nice to hear thank you for passing that on my, mm -hmm. my, my day is made <laughs> oh yeah yeah terrific so yeah, just uh, uh, let people know a little bit of details about uh, who you are there, and then uh, just uh, get into, I guess, your your article and what inspired you to write it to start off with, if you wouldn't okay. mind that. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, I'm a bit of a fraud as a as a Derridian. Um, for those who know a bit about Derrida, there are some incredibly passionate people who um who studied Derrida, who study him in depth, and so forth. Um, I was commissioned to write a biography of him, and. I'd studied him at university and, and loved him. Um, didn't always understand him, which is one oh, of the yeah. risks of Derrida. Um, pretended to have understood of grammatology for years and years and years without actually finishing it. Um, right. But when, once I started to study the life, I found him an incredibly powerful thinker, an incredibly interesting thinker. Um, and I think anyone who writes a biography, you become very close to your subject. Um, and but for me with Derrida, it was a real journey for myself as well to kind of learn about him, learn about his philosophy, to, to be honest, simplify it for myself, because one of the things about Derrida is he, he doesn't make it easy for the reader. I mean, he his position is that um, all words, as it were, are in quotation marks, and I'm sure we'll come back to that. So he doesn't want to make clear declarative statements because he's suspicious of them. So therefore, he's writing very much avoids making such statements. So it's it's elliptical, it has gaps, um, it compresses stuff down. It's very hard. It's it, it deliberately difficult. Um, yeah. So in a sense, writing the biography for me was trying to understand it, and it was written very much to the limits of my own intelligence, and then trying to make that something that I could communicate to other people. So, so that was, that was a, a wonderful thing to do because I think ultimately his ideas are simple and basic, and he, he followed them along, but he... Having had those ideas, he then had to write in a style and and bring in other ideas that were more complicated and more complex. So so that's where I come from. So I haven't been a hardcore Derridian all my life, as, as many people are. Um, but now I I I feel an incredible affection for him. And yeah, I do feel uh, uh, that it's my responsibility to defend him somewhat because at the during his life he was very a very controversial figure. Um, and there's been a sort of return of this controversy in the last few years with, as you mentioned, people like Jordan Peterson and the culture wars as it were where he's held up as somehow a god of wokeness or you know this this devil trying to overthrow all of philosophy all that's good in the world and so forth this just isn't true and um and uh, so yes I, I i feel i've been called on to defend him in many ways yeah yeah i appreciate that because you you know like you said there are so many people out there who are 
saying things about Derrida and Foucault uh, that are not true, and sometimes yeah. they're sometimes they're even the opposite of yes. what they said. Like for example, people people like Jordan Peterson use this label postmodern neo Marxist, but yeah. then like I've been doing a I've been doing a series on my channel about Foucault's book called The History of Sexuality and. Yes. There's a direct there's a direct quote in there that uh, that I've talked about before where he says government is the only fatal form of power. I'm like, yeah, yeah that sounds like a fucking Marxist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's, that's the thing. And, and I mean, for, for people watching this who may not be familiar with what, what with what has been happening. I mean, both Foucault and Derrida had very complex relationships to Marxism. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, it was part of the part of the intellectual ferment of, the, of their time. Um, Derrida wrote a book called Spectres of Marx, which I think is one of his most brilliant, but also most accessible books. Yeah, um, I like that one. It's, yeah. it's a great book. And, you know, basically, um, this is going down slightly, but let's do it. Um, he talks about, you know, Marx is the great materialist. Everything is, all of our thoughts are built from the world, from our labor and so forth. And Derrida looks for the use of the word spirit and ghosts and all those sorts of things within Marx's writing. So Derrida is always looking for when a, when a writer trips themselves up by including something that they're deliberately trying to exclude. So, so both of them had an incredibly complex relationship to Marxism. Um, but what, what has kind of happened in the last few years, I mean, the first thing to say, as I say in my article, is their names are being shackled together, you know, Derrida and Foucault yeah. and Derrida, which is um, insane in, in, in many, many ways. First of all, yes, they both questioned ideas of truth, but in very different ways. Um, in terms of their relationship to each other, um, it's not so much they didn't like each other. They were Foucault actually um, was Derrida's lecturer a, a few times at university, um, and apparently he used to take the students to um, psychiatric institutions. And, and Derrida got quite freaked out by this. Um, but then they were very close for a while. Then Derrida wrote an uh, an essay called Cogito in the History of Madness, where he took a really close look at Foucault's History of Madness and pulled some of it apart. Um, bizarrely, Foucault was actually at the at the dinner where he was giving the presentation. I thought it was a terrific paper. Um, I think maybe Foucault had had a few too many glasses of wine or something that night because actually it was a, a veiled attack on on Foucault, at least his philosophy anyway. So he did fall out for many many years. But then um, during the 80s, when Derrida was in jail briefly overnight in in Prague on a trumped up drug charge, you know, the people doing it said it was trumped up the day later. Um, Foucault rushed to his defence, and they actually became close again after that. But in terms of the actual personal relationship, and especially in terms of their philosophical relationship, they didn't actually have a lot in common. So this new word that exists, Derrida and Foucault, is um, it would, would surprise both of them, I think. Um, perhaps they wouldn't be surprised that they had, about what's happened to the world, but they would be surprised that they are, they are joined together in that way. Um, so, I mean, what, what, what's been happening is basically a couple of things, if, if, if I'll continue. Um, there is kind of held up as this as the person who brought wokeness to us. Um, now, first of all, there's big questions about the idea of wokeness because, from my point of view, woke is just respecting everyone's individuality, um, and that doesn't seem a terrible thing to me. Um, but obviously, it's complicated. But let's leave aside for a moment whether wokeness is good, bad, evil, whatever. Um, but it's it's not something that that should necessarily be linked to his name. And certainly, I think a lot of the people who do it do it absolutely lazily. And for me, the, the the thing that frustrates me, to be honest, more than anything else about people like Peterson, about people like Pluckrose and Lindsay, um, particularly Lindsay, again, we may cover that later, is they, they attack Derrida and various other thinkers. But very rarely do they quote these thinkers. Very rarely do they point to a passage where this has been said, it's like, it's like you said about the Foucault, there's a passage where he just refutes everything they're saying. Um, there's no passage in Derrida where he says there's no such thing as truth. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I think I say in the article, you know, because obviously I'm, I'm Twittering, I'm searching Twitter for references to Derrida, which I think is how we we probably met, um, you know, because I'm looking for what people are saying about him. And one of, the, one of the things they say is, you know, he is evil, he says there's no truth and da da da. And what, what I always do, well, I don't always do it because sometimes I get bored with doing it. I just say, well, which section of Derrida are you talking about? And in, you know, six, eight months of doing that, I've never had a response. That's always the end of the conversation. And for me, that is the frustration of it. You know, someone like, particularly Jordan Peterson, who I think is, you know, is an intelligent man, obviously. Um, what he says about Derrida just isn't in Derrida. Um, and I, 
I almost want to meet him and shake him and just say, could you read this? Could just read it and then we'll have the conversation. If you still think it's rubbish, then that's great because we've actually got something to talk about. Um, and, you know, Pluckrose and Lindsay quote one sentence of Derrida's. They say it's a mistranslation and, in fact, they then quote the mistranslation. Um, but they don't actually quote any other bits of Derrida. And, I mean, he wrote 80-something books. And, you know, there is a lot in there, in fact, where you could say, well, that's a bit dodgy or that's a bit strange or that's, you know, that's... But there's nothing that says there's no truth. But there's there's stuff they could grip onto. And they don't. And that, that makes it very hard arguing from the other side. Well, it makes it, in one sense, it makes it easy hard arguing from the other side because you just go, well, point to something. But it also makes it quite hard to engage with it. It's like they've decided he's evil and therefore everything about him is evil rather than actually working through his works. So that's kind of what's happening in the culture wars where, you know, Derrida and Foucault are, are held up as, you know, undermining Western and I've got to say white male heterosexual society in many, many ways. And I think that's the other big problem about it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of specters of Marx, yeah, yeah. I thought, I thought um, one thing that was really interesting that I noticed when I was reading that book is that, like you said, their, um, Derrida and Foucault's relationship to Marxism was complex because mm. I, know, I know that they, they used to, um, like both of them at one point used to be like at least sympathetic towards Marxism and then they uh like later on kind of turned against it and in Inspectors of Marx, Derrida, like you were saying, he points out some kind of good points that Marx makes and he also criticizes him. So it's not yeah. like he's going around saying let's all be Marxist, but he's yeah. also not saying that everything Marx ever said was awful and he was wrong about everything too. Yeah, and that's another thing that I've uh notice more recently too that i i took the time i took the time to read the what what marxists say is the more intellectual and detailed of marx's book which is capital volume yeah. one so i read yeah. that book and in that book he has he has much more detailed thoughts on things it's really dry and boring and it some is incredibly parts. boring yeah i don't but, recommend it to anyone <laughs> yeah, yeah but he does he does make some interesting arguments there and what i what i always find interesting when i investigate these uh famous or infamous thinkers is that sometimes even though usually the general criticism of them i would agree with like i don't think marxism is a very good idea for example um, I think that sometimes he made some points that almost sound like the opposite of what his his critics say. Like he exactly. said, some, he said a few things that I think made make it seem like he would be favorable to Bitcoin, for example, which seems like something that libertarians right. with would agree with. At least, at least some do. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. and yes. and yeah, also like um, uh, the uh, one thing I always like to mention about Derrida. And Foucault too is it is easy to misunderstand them because, like you said, their their writing style, both of their writing styles was kind of like just verbose and kind of abstract, so yeah. it was difficult to understand. Yeah. Um, and uh, I also wanted to comment on what you said about Peterson there too. Yeah, it is clear it is clear that he is um, an intelligent person, and I used to be a much bigger fan of his than I am now, but I would still say he's definitely like someone, uh, like a, a worthwhile um, a per figure for paying attention to. And mm. he, he makes some good points sometimes too. Like uh, I appreciate, especially in his earlier work where he talks more specifically about psychology and like his yeah. earlier book, Maps of Meaning, for example, where he's talking about multiple different religions and looking at more of the you know, the Jungian archetypes in yeah. that and then it seems like more recent well he got famous for being like anti-woke of course mm. and uh and then more recently it seemed like he's he's focusing so much on this narrow interpretation of just spreading Christianity everywhere and just mm. responsibility and all that kind of stuff and I know some some Christians who have an interest in philosophy who have like um, a more sophisticated view of Christianity than that as well. So 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's uh, that, I guess my long-winded way of saying it. I you made some very good points there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I agree totally about Peterson. I mean, he's fun to watch anyway because obviously he's become the kind of popular philosophy, popular philosopher of the masses now. Which I think, you know, I think his earlier work was more complicated, complex, and more interesting. I think it was more interesting. And I think you know he's kind of taken the ball and run with it a bit on his popularity. And you know, I do find that. I mean, why not? The man's got to live, so you know, <laughs> you may as well, you know, you may as well make money from it. But I do mm-hmm. kind of feel that he's, he's almost betrayed that, that his thinking, as it were, you know, and the fact that he's gone through all of this process and has pretty much come up with the model of what humans should be and what humans should be, as far as I can see, in his philosophy is, is kind of what they've always been, and all of these challenges from the outside that they're wrong somehow. You know, women challenging from the outside, um, different. Um, different colored people, you know, black people, you know, Jewish people, um, Asian people, challenging all of these tropes, um, is, is he's knocking them down. And I, I don't think he's always doing that consciously or, or you know, I'm, I'm not accusing him of racism or anything like that, but it just seems that we always end up back to the white male heterosexual as the norm. And, you know, this is, for me, part of the frustration is that, you know, it's unscientific as it were, you know, the, the whole question about identity, um, you know, Derrida had a complicated identity, Algerian, French, Jewish, all of that, and he brought that into his philosophy. But it, it keeps seeming through the, the, the writings of some of these anti-work brigade that questions of identity are new and they were suddenly invented in 1968 in France. <laughs> you know, what philosophy is, you know, that's what philosophy has always done. It's questioned what identity is. You know, Kant is all about what makes us human. It is all about what makes us human. Foucault is. That's that's basically what philosophers do. Um, so when, when they're saying that they, this is a, an attack on on identity, that's made up. That's false. This, this yeah. is just <laughs> philosophers doing what they do. And what, the reason I call it unscientific is traditional philosophy. You know, let's call it up till 1968 or whenever. You know, um, the mainstream of philosophy has taken as its set to be examined white male heterosexuals as the norm. Now, there's been bits and pieces around that. There's been questions about that. But that's essentially, that's the norm. So everything else is a bit of a deviation from the norm. What's happened is all the other objects in the world have started speaking back, have started giving their identity. Now, I think the duty then of philosophy, as any sort of scientific thing, would be, well, okay, the, the set of things we have to examine now has widened. We don't say, no, they're wrong. We say, okay, we've got to explore what it means to be a black woman in America or an Asian woman um, in England or, you know, any of this mixture, you know, or trans or or gay or all of these things. These are humans being human. Now, philosophy, I don't think, has the right to say, stop it. Philosophy, philosophy's job is to say, okay, we've got a wider set of circumstances here. Let's explore it. And for me, that is what people like Derrida, um, Foucault slightly less on that, but Derrida in particular, are doing. They're saying, okay, here's other voices. We have to listen to these other voices. And by li- listening to these other voices, we do philosophy. We, you know, and, and that for me is the disappointment of, of these battles against wokeness, as it were. It's more or less saying, as far as I can see, look, let's just go back, go back. This is getting out of hand. Let's just go back to what we were doing before. Identity is this. And it's just wrong and bad, bad philosophy, bad science. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Um, the, mm-hmm. it's uh it, it reminds me of uh, like how y- you know this this connection that people draw to people like Derrida and Foucault in terms in terms of wokeness is just totally backwards be uh, like because for example the way they approach identity it's not that they're saying it's not that they're promoting identity politics and saying everything is about identity all the time like no. Foucault, for example, is criticizing how identities are created. Like these, he talks as as a gay man a lot about how the category of homosexual became created as a way to divide people and to mark gay people as sinful and yeah. scientifically inferior. So. Mm. Uh, like these uh, just people uh, these like woke people who are obsessed with categories and say that you know everything is about identity and everything is about all the different physical immutable aspects of everyone's identity yeah. um yeah. 
I, I don't think that Derrida and Foucault would approve of that at all. And it, I, uh, one of the things you said there made me think too about how it, it's almost kind of like there's this, um, it, it's part of this criticism that I know is exaggerated uh, often, but uh, this div- su- this supposed divide between um, analytical and continental philosophy, yeah. like, of course, the some of the analytical philosophers, because they're all about being clear and making clear logical arguments, don't like all this kind of like creative exploring that some yeah. of the continental writers that are notorious for being confusing, like yes. Derrida and Foucault and, you know, Heidegger and Hegel and philosophers like that, as opposed to, you know, people like Locke or Kant or all of yeah. those Enlightenment philosophers. Yeah, absolutely. And and I can understand that, you know, if, if you are, and an, I, I, I don't like to divide very much either, but, you know, let's let's go with it for a moment. You know, th- one of the things about analytic philosophy is it, it pr- clarity is very, very important to it. You know, it, it, it thinks you, c- you have to be clear about concepts. Now, that's that's fine. And in a sense, as a, as a Derridian, you have to accept that that's one way of t- talking about the world. I mean, one of Derrida's things is there's lots of different ways of getting to truth. You know, there's poetry, there's analytic philosophy, there's novels, there's conversation. All of these things are ways of making truths, as it were. So I don't think Derrida would ever throw analytic philosophy out. But what he does say is that doesn't do enough. That doesn't capture everything. And I know for actually just the normal person talking about philosophy, analytic philosophy can seem quite difficult in many ways because it leaves so much out. You know, Derrida is, I think Derrida is always trying to say what it's like to be a human being. You know, that's that's what philosophy does best, I think. It says what it's like to be a human being. And you and I and everyone watching and, and everyone in the world have many different modes of being a human being. You know, we, we read a novel now and then we then we listen to some music and all of these things that we do, we, we uh, you know, we make love, we go through breakups, we, 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 we die, all of these things. Analytic philosophy doesn't, to me and to many people, manage to capture what that's like. And therefore, there's this vast field that's left out of analytic philosophy. So, and I think you're right, part of the hostility towards Derrida during his lifetime, certainly, was that he was saying that, you know, analytic philosophy is a rhetorical mode. You know, it is a way of talking about the world. Whereas those within it would like to say it is the truth, and he was saying no, it's it's not. He was not saying it was invalid, although I know he got frustrated and was attacked a lot for it, um, but uh, attacked a lot for his philosophy because you know he did say you know poetry will give us truths. Okay, there's there's no doubt about that. Anyone who reads poetry will learn something about humanity. So when he's writing his philosophy, why not use poetic modes? Why not use narrative tricks? Why not use he you know hyperbole? Why not you know use all of these devices because they're a way of, of telling the story of, of being human. And so he did that. Now, if you're a, a traditional analytic philosopher, you're going to be resistant to that because it, it undermines your pro, your, your whole process, as it were. So, and, and I think perhaps, you know, guided by you, uh, we might sort of tackle that idea of truth um, because I think this is the kind of the, the moment that it's, you know, it's the divide between analytic and continental. Um, and I know that's, you know, part of the reason we got in touch because, the, the the thing that Derrida is accused of is this relativism, isn't it? You know, that he you know, that yeah. he's skeptic, and that there is no truth. Um, and as we were saying right right at the start, you know, there, Derrida never says there's no truth. Um, what Derrida does is say we can't know. Okay, and it, and when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about capital T truth, the sort that philosophy is going for. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So. And I think a really useful comparison is the idea of God. Um, so in our lifetime, we can't prove the existence of God. Now, we can have faith that God exists. We can have faith that God doesn't exist. Both of those are valid positions of belief, of faith. But they are faith, you know. And basically, if God arrives at some point and proves his or her or its existence, then A, one of the religion wins or none of the religions win. But also, religion stops. You don't need religion anymore once God arrives. And for Derrida, this was what truth was. Truth was something that exists, that, that, that was outside of existence. If truth arrives, you don't need philosophy. Philosophy stops because, you know, job done. So in a sense, truth generates philosophy as God generates religion. So that was the idea of truth that he was, he was questioning. 
what's happened with the anti-woke brigade, I'll keep calling them that for shorthand, is they then say, well, he doesn't believe there's any truth. You know, he, he thinks if you go outside and it's raining, you won't get wet. Or he thinks that, you know, two plus two equal, doesn't equal four. At yeah. no point ever saying such things, you know. Um, and it, it became particularly um, prescient, didn't it, when there was the inauguration crowd for Donald Trump. And what was his name? Sean Spicer it was, wasn't it? He had to come out and say, you know, there is more people here than there's ever been. And then Kellyanne Conway said, well, alternative facts was her phrase, wasn't it? Alternative facts. Now, to say the truth is constructed or that it's, you know, under dispute and stuff, you can't still say, you still can't say that one crowd of 100,000 is bigger than a crowd of 200,000. You just can't um, yeah. because that's a mathematical truth. Now, you could say, well, we can't prove that until the end of time that mathematical truth exists. But if you're going to dispute mathematical truth, you have to take apart all of mathematics. You know, that's the thing. So, so Derrida would never say that two plus two equals five or that seven is you know, bigger than nine because that's an established mathematical truth. So this whole question of him saying that there's no truth is just a falsehood, an absolute falsehood. And all it is actually is him doing the same scepticism that philosophers have done since Socrates. You know, that's that's what they do. They question and question and question. And when big categories come up like truth, they say, well, hang on a minute. I've got some questions about this. And that's what Derrida is doing, I think. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well said. Yeah. And a, a lot of what you were thinking there, ironically enough, was making me think about how, you know, Jordan Peterson talks all the time about how there are different types of truth. Like there can be religious truths and there can be scientific truths, which like basically uh, Derrida and Foucault would probably agree with Jordan Absolutely. Peterson when he was arguing with Sam Harris a, a, against his rationalist approach in saying that, you know, there can be truths in poetry that are not necessarily scientri scientific truths, but that doesn't mean that scientific truths are not still true. It doesn't mean that two exactly. plus two equals equals five. It's just adding more, it's just adding more nuance to the concept of truth. It doesn't mean, it. that's where, uh, that's where like the woke people get this sort of thing wrong. Like they're just, they're just totally making up all this shit about how, you know, like this means that there's no such thing as a biological man or a biological woman like you can and also like they get like these public intellectuals get the idea of social construction wrong like a concept being socially constructed it means like the way we see a concept like the way we see a man is that a man has a penis and a woman has a vagina but that that doesn't mean that because we created these categories, it's no longer true that there is a biological man and a biological woman. It means we add social characteristics of human behavior to these categories. Yeah, although I think that does shift, doesn't it? And I think you know, mm -hmm. what is interesting in, in, in these, these very debates, and you know, I, I'm, I'm cautious about these debates, speaking as a white heterosexual man, that you know, obviously there are other voices which have more to say on this and, and better things to say on this than, than I do, because I speak from a position of real privilege um, because of all of those things. But you know, those, those categories are all open to dispute and to questions, aren't they? And I think you know, a lot of the sort of anti-woke stuff traduces people by by saying that this is all they're saying they're just arguing that it's all a free-for-all actually i don't think they are doing that i think that's actually a caricature of the other side you know i think the people who are actually involved in the battle are actually a lot more nuanced and a lot more complex than that you know these are issues that are being fought through now for some people who are right at the cutting edge of that you know who are for instance trans or, or whatever pick any category you want to this is a lived reality that they're living through and talking about and thinking about. And I do think there's been a, a bit of laziness in the anti-woke thing, saying that just woke people, and I, I hate these categories, but let's keep going. Woke people just want anarchy and they just want everything and blah, blah, blah. Actually, I don't think so. You know, it's, it's, it's like when the sort of Me Too movement happened, you know, men saying, oh, every woman will, you know, start to complain about everything that's happened. You'll never be able to go out on dates. You'll never be able to... Blah, blah. No. That just didn't happen. That wasn't going to happen and stuff. What what happened was there a more nuanced version of events came in, and I think that's what's happening. And and for me, I, I often think about because I, I teach creative writing a bit. I was in a class teaching 
about print. And someone said to me, you know, do you find it more difficult now to write as a, a white male because there's all these questions that you have, to, you know, are you, can, are you getting this right, are you getting that wrong and stuff like that? And my, my first response was, well, it's about time I had to ask those questions. You know, for years and years as a, as a, as a writer, I haven't had to ask those questions. I haven't had to look at my own identity. And there was a black woman in that class and she said, yeah, you're very lucky. You can write as anything. For me, every time I write, no matter what I write, I'm writing as a black woman. I can't escape that. And sometimes when I'm writing fiction, I don't want to have to do that. I, I want to write, you know, without that being my, my, my position. But I can't. I can never escape that. So I think, you know, a, a huge shift is happening. But I think that shift is simply people like me and people who have not had to think about their identity are having to think about it. And I think there are going to be battles about that. There's going to be questions about that. There's going to be, you know, some some questions within people who are, you know, that there's difficulties at the moment between the trans and, and some feminist thinkers. But that's those battles are things that are going to have to be worked out. And I do think there's a real, there, there is a lot happening where the other side who don't want to see these battles happen at all just say, well, they just want everything. You know, it's not, it's not, they're just making stuff up. And I don't think that's true. I think, you know, it is, it is complicated. But because it's complicated, it's interesting and stuff that we have to go through. So that's, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, like the way you were describing that black woman there is like you, like you said, it, it's kind of the opposite of the criticize uh, the criticism of wokeness often goes that it's that these people want to go around promoting the noble nature of like this woman would go around wanting everyone to insist that she's black all the time and say oh i apologize for your oppression you're so awesome because you're a black woman it's a, it's more that she's feels trapped in her identity like everyone notices it all the yeah, time, yeah. All the time. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, obviously, there are days that she does think that. Of course, you know, she's a human being. I'm sure, you know, again, this is part of my privilege. I don't wake up and face racism every day. You know, if I did, then I'm sure there's days when I'd be really, really pissed off with it, you know, frankly, um, and tell everyone to go fuck themselves. But, you know, there are also days when I, I wouldn't want to feel that. You know, th these are complicated people. They're, they're humans. You know, I, I'm complicated. I have days when, you know, I don't want to be me. And, you know, so, so just sort of lumping it everything together. But the difference for me is I can, in a sense, take my politics off for a day, can't I? I can relax. You and I can have an intellectual discussion about blackness, for instance. Whereas if I go out each day and that is something I'm confronted by and I know that my opportunities are less, I know that I'll be paid less, you know, or, you know, all of those things, then it's something which is constantly there. And to then ask me to not think about it and to not fight against it, and to not occasionally go fuck the lot of you is just ridiculous. Of course, you know, I, I, I <laughs> this you know imaginary person who has to think about identity should have the right to do that. And and to to try and stamp out these voices, I just think is well, a it's horrible and you know nasty in in so many ways and and you know blah, blah, blah. but it's also just stupid. You know, I, I would much rather see people who are dealing with these issues having to go. This is exciting, you know. This is philosophy live. This is what we're doing now. We're trying to work out what the difference between sex and gender is or or what, you know, listening to these voices means. That's exciting about philosophy now. That's exciting about the world now, I think. We've got to, you know, we've got to try and work this out. We've got to see these battles. Things have got to happen. Philosophy is not going, stop it, everybody. Let's just go back to where we were. Everyone settled down. And it's also not telling a person who is relating their experience um, that they should feel a particular way. It's not telling them that they should be politically active, but it's not telling them they can't be politically active. It's not saying that every day they have to feel one way and every other day they have to feel another way. You know, it's not doing that. Um, and I, for me, this it, the anti-woke thing seems to me to just be going, look, it's too complicated. Can you just stop? Can you just shut up? And the problem with telling people to shut up is often these are people who have been told to shut up for their entire lives. And, you know, it, it doesn't wash. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And the uh, like with the with the anti wokeness crowd, it's uh, like one thing that's interesting about that is there's, as you uh, alluded to earlier, there's this obsession with like, you know, um, the sort of white European culture of the nuclear family and 
traditional Christian values and all this sort of thing. And I, I think there there's value in some of that, but that being, that being criticized uh, as, as Foucault uh, and Derrida did in different ways, that's, yeah. that's perfect. The, these things are perfectly worthy of criticism, like traditional Western structures and how they sometimes imprison people in the way that other people see them and deconstruct and like this is important too like Derrida's idea of deconstruction this um that Foucault is also labeled as having done too even though uh they didn't necessarily use that word it's mm. a rhetorical exercise it's not saying we need to bring down all the western structures of society mm. and we should we should all be anarchists and and ath and atheists and marxists and all this radical stuff like yeah. that's not that's not really the point no absolutely no i mean one of the key things about deconstruction is it's not destruction and you know the um the history of the term in fact um is you know in a sense, Derrida borrowed it from Heidegger, his destruction with a K. Um, so it's not destruction at all, it's deconstruction. And the way I tend to explain it um, is that if something is constructed, it can be deconstructed, okay? So it can be taken apart to see how it works. Now, the thing is still there after you do that. Um, so, and the, the, the banal example I give is a chair. You know, a chair is constructed, okay? now. You can just sit on a chair. That's absolutely valid. Derrida would have no problem with you just sitting on the chair. However, if you want to analyze the chair, you can have a bit of a think about, you know, what is it made from? Okay, stuff like that. But also, how much did it cost? Why did it cost that much? Who built it? Why did I choose that chair? You can look at stuff like ergonomics. You can look at stuff like fashion. You can look at stuff, stuff like functionality, all of those things. So you can take apart the chair and, and you can come up with political ideas about the economics of the chair. You know, if the chair cost 80 quid, you know, I'm rich enough to buy an 80 quid chair. If it costs five quid, am I, did I do that because I'm not rich or did I do it because that's just a chair I like? All that stuff. So essentially, Derek is saying you can do that with anything. We can do that with truth. You can do that with God. You can do that with the, the white 2.4 kids family, the, no, the normal suburban family, all of those things, you don't just take them as natural. They're not natural things. They are cultural things. You know, the, the culture could have gone in any direction. We happen to be at the culture we are at now. Um, and you have to constantly be analysing why that has happened and what's going on there. And so so the idea that deconstruction is destruction, which again is, is, is thrown around so much, it was during Derrida's lifetime as well, even though he wrote again and again and again to say, that's not what I'm doing, that's not what I'm saying. Um, you know, he, he said, all, we, all I'm asking for is to analyse this and analyse this. But he was also interested, and I think this is where he's slightly different, this is a step he makes, which I think is almost unique. He, he doesn't think you can actually come up with a coherent, finished idea. You know, so, so he finds that moment where you go, this is the idea, the interesting moment, because at that point you're doing, he called it a violence. But you're deciding if you're saying, okay, truth, we've come up, we've looked at what truth is, duh, 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 so we now have the idea of truth. He says, labeling as that, you're excluding a whole bunch of other stuff. If that is truth, and let's go with analytic philosophers saying truth is two plus two equals four, he's saying, well, what about poetry? Well, what about this? What about that? Why are you not including those things? There's something going on here that they're being excluded. Um, and Derrida, particularly late Derrida, had this great notion of hauntology which uh, in French is very close to the word ontology. Ontology is the study of what there is. You know, it's what philosophy has always done. Objects in the world, what is there? Uh, Derrida looks at hauntology, which is what isn't there, what is missing. If I say a word, then there's a lot of words I didn't say. If I go to a party and, you know, I'm having a lovely time and suddenly it's pointed out that everyone there is white, why is, why, why is everyone there white? If, you know, um, if I'm dreaming of a future and the future never arrives, does that future inform me in some way? And Spectres of Marx is about that as well, you know, this idea of a lost future. Um, and there's there's some great music, in fact, hauntological music, which um, is also called hypnagogic music, um, which is about lost futures. And, and it's a very strange sounding music where it talks about, you know, these futures that we have in us, you know, all of us individually have this. I have a, 
I have a, a future of who Peter Salmon will be in 20 years' time. I may not refer to it very often, but the way I live my life now has that built into it. Um, but these are these are kind of things that don't exist as objects, which affect our day-to-day -day life, and that's that's kind of the hauntological thinking of, of Derrida. Oh, okay. interesting. I haven't heard of that. I should uh, I should read yeah. more about, about that. Yeah, well, um, if, if, you, if, you, if you're liking Derrida and you can't be bothered reading him, listen to Hauntological Music. Spotify, do your search, Hauntological, there's great stuff. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, uh, like, in, in, terms of, in terms of truth, for example, this is, uh, like, people get really threatened when you, uh, when you uh, criticize what people don't necessarily even see as um uh as their their philo their particular philosophical perspective on the issue of truth like mm. a lot of people just they just don't like their correspondence theory of truth being criticized that yeah. you know i see i see this uh, i see this lighter therefore that means it is true that this lighter exists but mm. you know like if you examine that this is uh, this is also sort of an empiricist version of truth. Like I can trust what I see, but we know scientifically that for that we evolved to chunk information and miss information in the world and misinterpret it, so we can focus on that line over there in in the grass, so we can run away from it without considering every detail of the situation yeah. first. Yeah. And this like this idea the, like one of the reasons that my favorite pragmatist is Richard Rorty is because he criticizes the correspondence theory of truth and he, and he gets called a postmodernist incorrectly again I would say by some people because he he criticizes the correspondence theory of truth and then he basically one of his uh, uh so one of his i think it's one of his essays i forget which book it's in but it's about how in his opinion love uh love and hope are better than truth which i th i think that's a i think that's a beautiful way yeah. to think and Absolutely. you know some people would say that's a truth statement but then mm -hmm. you could say what type of truth statement is it yeah. and is that in as important as analyzing as just valuing love and hope and thinking yeah. more about those ideas sometimes yeah. those are more more relevant than considering what is true absolutely and i mean the thing that Rorty is doing there in, in a statement like that as well is he, you know forgetting for a moment whether it's true or not it has a poetic truth doesn't it? it's a beautiful thing to say it it, it it reveals something about the way we live to, to have that thing and i think one of the um one of the strange things about the criticisms of, of Derrida or something that, that they don't really acknowledge is actually in our day-to-day -day life, we have many different registers of truth, don't we? I mean, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but you know, if I read a poem or a novel, I might write how true in the margin. You know, I, I see something, I write how true. Then if I do some mathematics, I'll do a quadratic equation or probably just two plus two equals four. I'll go, well, that's true as well. And then my friend will tell me they're having a terrible time and their boyfriend's a bastard and isn't he awful? And I've got to leave. And I'll think, oh, that's true as well. Um, you might say something now. And I go, yep, that's true. So these are all different registers of truth. the different types of truth. I don't notice I'm switching between them. I don't, every time this happens, go, my God, that's a different type of truth I'm doing. I'm doing mathematical truth now. I'm doing poetic truth. You know, in our day-to-day -day life, actually, we have all these different registers of truth, you know, as Jordan Peterson saying you know these are different types of truths um, it's only when you sort of then have to take all of those different truths you know the truth of what Rorty said the truth of the wasteland by Eliot the truth of two plus two equals four and go okay what's the same about them what what can I get from them that mean that means their truth well nothing necessarily I mean that there's a there's a, a phrase by Wittgenstein where he says um if you want to know the meaning of the word God look at how it's used um, and I think that's the same with truth you know to, to see what it means look at how it's used um, and on, on the correspondence theory of truth, I mean, for me, kind of the breakthrough when I started to understand Derrida a lot more was looking at the work of Edmund Husserl, um, German philosopher from the 30s, who I got a bit obsessed by. And, you know, most of my editing of the book was cutting out more Husserl and cutting out more Husserl. Um, but Husserl gave birth to phenomenology. And for those who may not be familiar, familiar 
phenomenology basically says the question of whether the world exists or your lighter exists, let's put that to one side, okay? It's an interesting question, but let's not spend all of our time trying to work out that question. What we need to do is describe how we experience the world. The world may or may not exist, and Husserl had his own views on that, but what we have to do is see how we experience it. So your lighter is an object in the world. We, we all seem to agree about that, so let's go with that. That makes sense. We, we, we don't question that in day-to-day -day life. Sometimes when we're doing philosophy, we question it. But in day-to-day -day life, if I was questioning whether this screen exists or whether you exist or whether, you know, whether this glass of water exists all the time, I'd go mad. You know, so we don't do that. That's not actually how we live. So, so we live in a, in a world and experience it. And Derrida was basically doing that. He was saying, okay, those questions about the correspondence idea of truth, let's, let's put them to one side, but let's just talk about how we experience the world. And one of the ways we experience the world is in different ways of truth, you know, in different beliefs and, and all of those things. So, you know, that, that for me is, is, is kind of the basis of it, as it were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, like, like to go back to how um, Derrida um, and Foucault and the so-called so-called postmodernists are labeled as relativists. They're like even even though, like you said, Derrida doesn't necessarily think that there's some final truth that mm. you can arrive at that's eternal and never changes. That doesn't mean that every interpretation of something is equally valid and there are no true state statements that are better than any other true statements. Like, like you were saying, it's not, it's not like saying that my lighter exists is the exact same truth statement as saying that my lighter does not exist. So for example, like it's not the case contrary to what members of the IDW say uh, that, you know, there, there are, all um all interpretations of Shakespeare's Hamlet are equally valid. There is no interpretation of it that is better than any other interpretation. You could yeah. interpret this as being about how aliens are really cool and we should worship aliens. And that's yeah. just that could be considered just as good of an inter interpretation as any other one. It's it's more yeah. like pluralism. Like there can be exactly. many different uh valid interpretations of yeah. a piece of literature and some make more sense than others that's, exactly. that's all it is basically that's, that's absolutely right i mean there's two things there isn't there first first of all going back to your lighter i mean what what derrida is saying and, and which many many philosophers have said you know throughout history is that you can't actually have an unmediated experience of it Okay, well, so when we're talking about sort of relative and so forth, you can't actually just get to the lighter itself because if we had an unmediated relationship to the world, we'd be surprised by every single thing we encounter. You know, you'd be, oh, well, what's that, a lighter? Oh, what's that? Because you wouldn't have the concept of lighter. You wouldn't know what it's for. You wouldn't know how to work it. So, you know, in a basic sense, that's our relationship to the world. It's always mediated through concepts, you know, particularly. You know, we, we learn all these concepts and we that's how we deal with the world. So that's the first part of it. Um, but, yeah. When analyzing pieces of literature, pieces of art, anything, basically, yes, there are more valid analyses than other analyses. You know, if I, if my criticism of a film is just to yell the word cheese for an hour, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not going to actually do anything, is it? Um, yeah. But, the, but the, the thing is, so, so you have more or less valid. But what I think the sort of arguments against Derrida tend to go is, well, everyone's going to do that. Everyone's going to yell cheese at the screen for an hour. <laughs> you know, but what? But, but that's, in a sense, to try and stop people doing what they're afraid of, which is bringing in some analyses which are more, more out there, you know, more, you know, questioning the role of race in Jane Austen or questioning, you know, the, the, how, you know, um, sexuality happens in the films of Hitchcock and stuff like that. So those are, are ways of viewing pieces of art that for, I think, before 68 or whatever, were less common, that, you know, people would just go a fairly standard, you know, this is what the piece of art, uh, I'm, I'm cutting out vast amounts of history in that and, and you know, and great thinkers. But, you know, that's, that's the thing. I, I, I do suspect that the people who are arguing against it are saying, well, let's just go back to what we were doing before. Again, I'm saying the same thing, but we go back to what we we're doing before and get rid of these, you know, more strange analyses because some of those strange analyses are just strange and they're no use and, you know, forget them. But some of them hit a mark, 
reveal something. And, you know, I'd much rather 200 people doing ridiculous analyses of Jane Austen and coming up with nothing and one of them suddenly going, hang on, have you noticed how the people who earn money in this, they're always the males and they always earn an exact certain amount and the women are therefore pushed to one side. Isn't that interesting? And suddenly that opens up a whole bunch of stuff. I'd rather that happens and we just go, just analyze Jane Austen in terms of language and we'll just, that's fine. So, you know, that's that's the thing I think, you know, we uh, allowing this doesn't again allow for anarchy, you know, because you're not gonna get a university thing analyzing, you know, by yelling cheese as you're <laughs> explaining. But you might get it by analyzing the, the role of race or economics or stuff like that in, in a particular film. Yeah, yeah. That, it's funny uh, when when you were uh, mentioning Jane Austen, I was thinking about how uh, I I recently watched the movie Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. So, <laughs> I haven't seen so, it. Is it good? <laughs> well, it, it's exactly what you would expect. Basically, right. it's like adding yeah. like cheesy zombiness to Fantastic. that world, and yeah. I think it's in, I think it's interesting too because it's that like. That's one example of how, you know, adding this bizarre horror concept of zombies, which I think are an awesome and fascinating concept to Jane Austen, can make yeah. people more interested in uh, the ideas in Jane Austen. I mean, full Absolutely. disclosure, I have copies of Jane Austen books, but I have not read them yet. Right, but, yep. the, um, but in the in the Pride and Prejudice and Zombies movie, there are still these themes about the, uh, like how much people value class division and, and, uh, and marriage and mm. all this sort of stuff and how there is a love story and people are denying that they're in love with each other based on their yeah. class division and all that sort of thing. So yeah. that's like, you could look at that as, this really wild out there interpretation of Jane Austen that still communicates like what are understood to be some of the main themes of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, that's an absolutely brilliant example, isn't it? You know, a, a, a married couple discussing their future and their land and all that sort of stuff is very different when there's a zombie in the room or a zombie coming yeah. out, you know, isn't it? But it's, it's throws things into sharp relief. And I think a lot of you know, the, these analyses of, you know, texts from the canon or, you know, whatever they are, being looked at from very different angles does reveal truths about them. And, and you know, I, I I love fiction, I love literature. And I think one of the, the marvelous things about literature, poetry, plays, whatever, is that they are open to new interpretations. That, that you know, they're not a closed thing, are they? You, 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 one of the great things about, or any writing, in fact, is that it can continue to live and continue to change. You know, the William Shakespeare of the you know of the 16th century late you know late 16th early 17th century is different to the william shakespeare of the 18th century is different to the william shakespeare of the 21st century because and i think particularly great pieces are the ones that are more open to more and more interpretations you know um there's an openness to them and i think you know that's we're living through an age where a lot of the interpretations now are coming from these new voices that are speaking and saying well hang on you're missing out a whole lot. And that's absolutely terrific. And, you know, in a hundred years time, there may be a completely different way of looking at Shakespeare. And, you know, the, the, some of these issues will have resolved themselves, but, you know, robots might be saying, well, where, where are the robots in Shakespeare? You know, it's about time that they were represented. So who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There could be uh, like interpretations of Shakespeare with robots at some point in the it, future. That'd be, it, that'd be interesting to see. I, yeah, I would yeah. check that out for sure. <laughs> it would probably make shakespeare more uh more interesting to like science fiction nerds basically Absolutely, yeah. yeah science fiction shakespeare that's the future that's if i can if we can come up with one thing from this discussion it's science fiction shakespeare and a yeah. review which says cheese 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 <laughs> yeah yeah right. exactly exactly <laughs> um oh uh someone uh commented here I, I i'm gonna i'm gonna show both of these here one of them we we touched on this before the truth debate between sam harris and Peter Jordanson. That, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we we could talk about that a little bit more. And then uh, also, Strider Yoko said, "What is your favorite piece of literature?" I don't sure. I don't know if I I don't know if I have an all time favorite, but what one of my favorites for sure is Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Ah uh, yes. And I, and I also love George Orwell's Nineteen Eighty Four. Mm. um yeah and there are many uh many others that i like too like uh 
I really I really like the Dresden Files fantasy series. There's book 12 in that series called Changes is one of my favorite. And I like the um, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo slash, slash Millennium Trilogy. I, I usually have to give like a top five when people ask if there's one favorite. Right. Um, yep. So, so uh, what, uh, what about you on that question? And then we could talk about the Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. Yeah, debate. sure. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a Proust obsessive. I don't know if anyone wants to devote like three or four years of their life to reading Proust. Um, it's, uh, I mean, he's just, I think he's the best, you know, and, and that I'm going to use a completely underridian term and just say he's the absolute best. Uh, he just, you, you read it and I, I almost guarantee every single emotion you've had, even the most fleeting, he will tell you about. He'll, he'll write a paragraph about it. He's just astonishing and incredibly funny. So very, very funny, which people don't tend to know about Proust. Um, I agree absolutely about Heart of Darkness. I just think um, it's I, – I can't quote quite quote the whole thing from, from start to end, but there's just bits of that that come back to me again and again. And it's a really great example, isn't it, of a, a book that shifted meaning over time, it's just changed and changed and changed. Uh, uh, ideas around race, certainly, and about imperialism and all that sort of stuff, which makes it sound an issue-based book. It's also just a fantastic read. You know, it's just gripping and 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 absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. A book I read recently, which blew my mind, is called Zone by Matthias Ennard, um, and it's one sentence. The book goes for like four hundred pages, or one sentence. That's oh, fun. interesting. Um, and there's a couple of bits where the character himself is reading a book. So uh, those bits are in, in normal, normal, whatever normal is. But basically, there's a guy who's supposed to be meeting up with someone, uh, supposed to be caught a plane, misses the plane, gets on a train, gets a load of speed because he's, you know, because he's got a load of speed with him. So he has to swallow all the speed so he's not caught. And then basically goes on this monologue about European history for 400 pages. And it sounds terrible and sounds exhausting. And like 30 pages in, you just want to die and go, I don't want any more of this. Um, but it's one of those books where once you start to get carried along with it, um, you, it's just, yeah, I think, you know, one of the great books, you know, that's going around at the moment. So, so there's three. <laughs> What's that one? Uh, it's called Zone by Matthias oh. Ennard. I'm trying to see if I can see it quickly. Hang on one sec. Okay. That sounds like a really interesting concept. That's, that's, that's where are we? there we are. Oh, okay. So yeah, interesting. That's a very interesting concept. Yeah, yeah it's great. I, I I like it. Lots of people hate it, so you, you, you can decide for yourself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the uh, Strawberry Yoko had said overuse of the word "by the by" in that book, Heart of Darkness. <laughs> I hadn't noticed that before. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, sorry, when it said overuse of the word, I thought um, it was going to say, um, as it were. I find myself saying, as it were, all the time. And I, I, every time I do one of these talks, I, I write down, don't say, as it were. And it is again, as it were. So, oh, well, okay. thank you very much, Strider Yoko. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah it's, actually, um, it's actually not books. It's actually just the painting of books that make you Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit more about that uh, infamous debate between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson about truth? Um, I think what we were kind of seeming to say earlier is that, you know, basically Jordan Peterson was talking about how there are different types of truth. And Sam Harris was basically saying, no, there was only one materialist, yeah. rationalist, scientific definition of truth that you must adhere to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's a lot of the, the ground we've already covered, isn't it? Apart from the sort of big headline that Peterson's on our side for this one, or well, my side, I, I won't speak for you, but um, in saying that, you know, truth is is a, a concept that has many, many different uses. I'm, I'm slightly bemused that Jordan Peterson in his ideas of truth will exclude Derrida. <laughs> you know, all these things can be true, but not him. He's, no, not him. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting debate, isn't it? Because this is an ongoing debate, and I think it's going to go for a very long time. In fact, in a way, it's gone for the whole history of philosophy, hasn't it? Is there truth or is there not truth? Um, you know, the idealist, the realist, and, and, and so on. The correspondence idea of truth as opposed to coherence idea of truth. Um, I do, you know, my, my natural inclination is to be suspicious of the idea of one truth, um, partially for philosophical reasons, also for political reasons. I mean, I think there is a real danger, and the word is totalitarianism, isn't it? Where if you are saying, and I'm not accusing Sam Harris of this, you know, because it's obviously a philosophical position, 
But eventually, if you're saying there is a truth that we are moving towards, then everyone not moving towards that particular truth is excluded. Or, you know, if that truth is something which reinforces the powers that be, then that's a bit of a problem too. So I, I am more comfortable with the idea of multiple truths, and I think that is closer to how we actually live our lives. You know, everyone watching this, you and I, we have very different truths and different lives. Now, obviously, there's something that's coming in common here that we're interested in this idea, and the people who are watching, it's a, it's a self-selecting group to an extent, isn't it? Um, but still, we're all incredibly different people. Now, that is not to say that we don't have communal things in common apart from this situation. But to say that somehow we all have this one truth that we're getting to, I think is a very dangerous concept. And in fact, it's, it's weird that people who accuse Derrida of being this um, Marxist person and one of their objections to Marxism is that it has a single totalitarian truth. Exactly. Which yeah. isn't actually Marxism. It is Stalinism, but it's not Marxism. Um, it's very weird to them have, hear them saying, but, 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 but I know the truth. It's, my problem is not that Marx has his truth. It's that my truth is right and his is wrong. That's I don't like that. <laughs> I think yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, this is a this is one thing that I, I've talked about before that also annoys me. Like it's uh, it's not say it, it's not like people who are called postmodernists like Derrida and Foucault. They're not going around saying my definition of truth is correct, yours is wrong. You must accept my accept my definition of truth. Like yeah, oh, it's. It's pluralism, and I like what you said there. I, I like to, I like also to look at different types of truth, and like you said, because that's more that's more like the way we actually live our lives. We don't we don't go around saying like this is true, uh, this is this is not true. Uh, I wonder if it's mathematically, scientifically true that I am yeah. holding a coffee cup right now. Yeah, exactly. That's right. We, we couldn't exist, you know, and that's and uh, it would just be an absolute madhouse. And um, and so I, I've always had a real suspicion about this idea that there there is a truth that we're aiming for, because it seems to say that if you if you don't accept that, then you you do fall into a position of not believing you're holding a coffee cup. Now, me saying that I don't believe that there's a single truth that we're aiming for and that truth is called God or that truth is called the good, use Plato or whatever. Saying that I don't believe that isn't to say that I, I, I can't accept the fact that you're holding a coffee cup. That makes no sense to me in this new world without truth. You know, both both positions are you know, completely complementary of each other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You you don't need to you don't need to exclude one type of truth to to have other types. Exactly. Yeah. Which is, uh, which is why like Bas uh, like basically, Jordan Peterson seems to have a postmodernist conception of truth because he's mm. talking about how you know it's true that two plus two equals four, but you could also say in a way that some of what's promoted in the Bible and other religions are true in sort of a religious or spiritual way, like mm. it's it's noble to sacrifice yourself for your cause or, you know, love your neighbor as yourself and th those okay. sorts of things. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and yeah, I mean, that for me again is, is the limit I find with Jordan Peterson and, and the frustration with him, because I, if I just can't find anything where he's actually read Derrida and in order to criticize him and, and therefore his, his pluralist, what I think is Jordan Peterson's pluralistic notion of truth yeah, I think I think he quite liked Derrida if he read him yeah, <laughs> for, right, exactly. for whatever reasons, you know. And maybe yeah. he has read him. He just won't quote him. He won't say bits. So I've got it until he does quote bits. Then I have to decide that he hasn't. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, oh, uh, this uh, Strider Yoko commented again and said, uh, "I just finished reading the Moral Landscape by Sam Harris. I assume that you would think a scientifically derived morality." Mer ridiculous i i would i would consider that i read that book uh also years ago and i used to i used to be like a militant atheist rationalist so i really liked it at the time mm. but now i think his like uh scientific version of morality as if we as if we can have scientific moral values just really doesn't make any sense 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say ridiculous because I think there's, there's a danger in saying ridiculous, isn't there, in that you are then doing exactly what I've just accused Jordan Peterson of saying, That's I believe great. in these trees, but not, but not those ones. I mean, for me, let's imagine a world for a moment where you can't, where morals are scientifically derived, you know, where, you know, that's how that's how I have it's all about biology and stuff like that. That's how I have my moral positions as an act of biology. If even if I accept that, my lived experience is not that. And I think part of the duty of philosophy is to explain my lived experience. You know, I, I happen to be an atheist as well. You know, I, I for me, I don't need God in order to explain why I'm here. I think I think the Big Bang theory and biology and evolution make sense. Okay, that's my position. Um, but I think religion is an incredibly valuable thing for explaining how I feel about being in the world. You know, to, to explain my experience, then religion has that function. Now, there's a lot of stuff that happens to me scientifically and biologically, you know, um, talking or, or, you know, having a glass of water or whatever, you're sleeping, all of those things. Sure, you might be able to explain them scientifically. You know, you might be able to explain love scientifically because I have these pheromones and the person, my loved object has those pheromones, I'm in love. Terrific. Okay, tick. But that doesn't describe what it's like to be in love. You know, poetry and literature has been describing what it's like to be in love for millennia and will continue to do so because that's the lived experience. So I don't actually think that the morals are scientifically based. But even if I did, I don't think that changes the necessity for talking about them, analysing about them, religious explorations, philosophical explorations. I think they're all valid. Absolutely. Mm hmm. Yeah, well said. Uh, I mean, even even if moral truths are to be derived from science, even if that is the case, that's not how we actually live our lives. So yeah. it, it is important to still examine these these sorts of subjects like poetry and religion and fiction because th that's how we that's how we can get. Even if you don't want to call it truth, that that's how we can get useful advice for how we live our lives like even if you if you read often if you read a novel it really helps you understand people who are dealing with totally different circumstances from what you could ever imagine but it's still the types of circumstances that you can relate to real life even if it's like some crazy science fiction or fantasy story like these people have to use their magic powers to fight other people with magic powers and or or in some science fiction universe you're trying to stop some evil ai from destroying the world like these are interesting concepts to explore because you would never really you probably will never actually experience that in real life so you're mm. living vicariously through the lives of these fictional characters or if you're talking about a non-fiction book these real people too and you're kind of getting like a tiny sense of what it's like to be them in a way yeah that's right and i mean ultimately i mean science can pretty much explain the basic needs of humans can't it? We, we need shelter we need food we need sex those are the, the three basic needs of, of humans um so how do you explain a city how do you explain a community how do you explain us doing this zoom conversation how do you explain all of these things they don't fit within those categories. Now, you could go back and back and back and back and back and say, okay, in order to have shelter, I need to have employment, therefore I need to write books, and therefore I write a book, and therefore to promote a book, I come on this, so it's all about me having shelter. And that doesn't explain what we're doing here, does it, you know, in the slightest? So, you know, and I think that's that's the problem with a scientific explanation. Even if they're true, in some sense, they're not, they don't, they don't describe what's going on. And I think they're explanatory for is actually quite small in many ways yeah yeah like we were talking about it can tell you it can tell you some things that are that are true like it tells you science tells you what is true it doesn't tell you why it's true or why that truth is important or how we can use it or why or it's, we, why it's relevant or, yeah, or how, we, how we experience it you know, and again, the, the love example is, is, a, is a great example, isn't it? You know, science can probably explain love and probably one day will explain love, but that's not going to help me when I'm, you know, going on a date, is it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. If it, yeah, if you're going on a date, you don't need to, you don't need to know. Okay, yeah. so it's all about oxytocin. 
Yeah, so, exactly. Then, yeah. So then, but you're going from that scientific truth to try to basically like applying it to the like the, how you live your daily life. Like, how can I use this truth about oxytocin to yeah. try to get us to form a connection based on oxytocin? I wonder if I can figure out how to do this. Yeah. It's not. It's not. It's not a great opening gambit on a date. I think you know. I've yeah. tried it. It's, it's just terrible. So you know. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah exactly. and 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 so yeah. So the initial question about morals, I think, is exactly, exactly the same. You know that you know, I, as I experience it, I think I have moral agency. I think I make decisions. I think I, when when confronted with a moral decision, I think that I assess the options. Now, if I don't, that doesn't change the fact that I think that I do, and that's. You know, that's what ethics and morality is about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That's uh, like that's basically basically we're talking about how you know truth is is complex and it can mm -hmm. be used for different things, and there there are different types of it. Which it seems it seems like Jordan Peterson and other members of the uh, the IDW perhaps too. Um, adhere to even though they criticize it and label people like Derrida and Foucault as postmodernists for thinking that way even though that's not even though that itself is not actually true and they also rejected the label postmodernist anyway like I think it's a, it's a famously the first time someone asked Foucault, if he was a postmodernist, he said, "What is that?" <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. And you know, I, I I don't think either of them. I mean, what philosophers always do is, whenever you tell them they're part of something, they say, "No, I'm not." Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there is that. Um, but you know, I think postmodernism is really, you know, um, a much more. I think it's much more referential to art. I think it's you know, it referential, not reverential, re referring to art. Um, it takes apart the, the bits of art and looks at them and then tries to sort of satirize them or it's ironic or whatever. Um, I actually think in a lot of, of ways that Derrida writes is actually a, quite a modernist, you know, modernist, the, the school of, you know, really pushing literature to its breaking point. And I think Derrida does that with a lot of his narrative style. So I think he's actually more modernist than postmodernist. But that's a, that's a, a separate debate. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the... Uh... The, it's interesting to um and uh the now i try to i try to i try to mention this all the time like the way that people use postmodernist is not even not even correct really like there there isn't this movement of people with one coherent worldview called postmodernists who are advocating for people yeah. to become political activists or marxists or something like that. It's uh, like there's there's a distinction between the postmodern era, which is a, a period of history that's supposedly after the postmodern era, and then mm -hmm. there's the the postmodern condition, like the way people think differently and analyze the structures of Western society in the supposed postmodern era, and then postmodernism is more like it's more that uh, like you were saying it, there's sort of a postmodernist approach to analyzing literature and film mostly that's like what it's most widely associated with mm -hmm. and yeah. you could more um more accurately perhaps label thinkers as Foucault and Derrida as post-structuralists in that they were anal in just the sense that they were analyzing the structures of Western society, but it's hard to like link any of these people together in consistent movements of thought, be, uh, partially because, like you were saying, they disagreed about a lot of different things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's often lazy thinking, isn't it? And it's happened throughout history, but I think, you know, at the moment, you know, postmodernism can just be thrown out at people or critical race theories can just be thrown at people as a, as a, as a label. And it doesn't actually really apply to them is, is part of the problem. But also it just kind of assumes that now, if I wake up one morning, I'm postmodernist. Then my every encounter with the world is now postmodernist, and I'm being postmodernist all over the place. And and I'm not, you know, I'm, 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 I'm,
or you know or new criticism or you know i'll approach things in, in different ways so so these labels i think i i think they're useful because you know like all words in the language you can use them to summarize some thoughts but just going a we don't like postmodernism and b therefore these people are postmodernists uh, which i think tends to be the way around they do it um just lazy thinking and, and particularly in the case of Foucault and Derrida who might, might have been a lot of things but weren't postmodernist in, in their approaches whatsoever. So I, I don't think they were very interested in postmodernism as it were. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 The, um, the, um, what, one thing that I, I wanted to uh, mention too, um, uh, we talked about um, cynical theories. Maybe we could talk about that a little bit more. Sure. Um, I, it, it's interesting. I participated um, on uh, on a YouTube chat, um, very briefly with James Lindsay, we were talking, um, I was talking with some other people along with him about his book with Peter Bogosian, uh, that I actually really liked their, their book called how to have impossible conversations. And, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're associated with sort of a, a community that, uh, I know a few people in mainly Reed nice wonder who has a street epistemology channel. Um, called cordial curiosity and and they basically kind of use the socratic method on people and just ask people questions about their views um mm. and so i got to talk to james Lindsay a, a little bit and i was asking him about postmodernism, and he said he had been reading more of it and he thought and i like to make this correction all the time that the roots of this wokeness is more in like the frankfurt school of philosophy with <laughs> which is more yeah. people who were actual, some of whom were actual Marxists or were sort of advocating for those sorts of views. And they were in opposition to people who were called postmodernists. And mm. uh, I actually was going to talk with him um, about this subject at one time, but it didn't end up happening, which is really disappointing because I would have yeah. wanted to make a lot of these same points. And uh, I, I read... Um, cynical theories recently and i took a whole bunch of notes and i'm going to uh, just like i just like i did with jordan peterson's new book mm. beyond order i'm going to do a whole video series on cynical theories because i made copious notes on each chapters like mm. no they didn't foucault did not say this no derrida did not say this no they yeah. were not connected to this movement of thinkers yeah yeah i've, I've got i mean i don't as a you know, I don't naturally like dissing other people's books. I was, I got to say, I was disappointed because I, I, I read it because you know people were talking about my book and talking about it at the same time. So I, I thought I'd read it, and again, it was. I, I mean, I, I don't know how much people know about James Lindsay, and particularly James Lindsay, in the last few months. Um, his Twitter feed is astonishing, really. Um, yeah, I find it very difficult reading. Um, Helen Plecko. I, um, I don't know that much about that. What's what's going on? Well, uh, <laughs> it's let's 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 just say it doesn't. It's not very coherent. Um, I think he he's he verges on some positions that I find very very politically uncomfortable. Uh, he then often yells back that he's not doing that, but but, but you know it's it's. Yeah, it's megaphone, shouty, everyone's wrong except him occasionally. Um, and oh, I think he, he and Helen Pluckrose kind of uh, pulled apart for a little while. I don't know if that's still the case. You know, I'm, um, I, so I'm, I'm very I'm careful about talking too much about a pair of them as a pair because I know she was, and again, now I'm speaking for her, but I shouldn't speak for her, but I think going by some of her tweets, she was quite hurt about what was going on. So, but anyway. Oh, okay. Um, so that's that's worth checking out. But the book itself, I did I did find um, I just found it was bad bad scholarship was the thing. And again, this is the, the the thing again again frustrates me about these. And as you were saying, you know, it's not enough just to say these things are wrong. You you have to actually engage with them. And some of the stuff they do start to engage with a bit. But again and again, it was just stuff that wasn't true. And it's very hard reading a book like that where you just go, well, that's not true. 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 Um, and particularly when some of the things that they were arguing, and they say at the start of the book, they're not far right nut jobs, you know, to, to you know, use a phrase. But a lot of the things they're saying have been by people who are. And I think there's a real danger there, and I think it's not one they disassociate themselves from enough. 
And if you keep saying these things that later are taken up by people who are some of them fascists, um, then you've got a problem and you need to re-explore what you're doing and you need to be very, very careful about it. And I think particularly uh, James Lindsay isn't so careful about that. Um, and that's the thing that annoys me about it. I think it just, I just wish it was a bit better and, and a bit better thought through um, is, is my thing with them, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, but the reason I'm being a little bit cautious um, is because I think what I, you know, would like to come out of this or all of this is to try and turn some of the heat down on these things because it does seem more and more to be people yelling at each other. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, when you say Jordan Peterson had, you know, talked about different truths, well, that that's something to clip, grip onto, isn't it? That's, some, that's a conversation that can actually be had. Um, because I think, you know, looking at, I mean, the model for me is a bit, you know, politics in the in United States, which is just completely divided and seems to me just two groups of people just yelling at each other um, and having literally nothing to say to each other, no coherent strategies. Um, and, you know, I obviously have a particular side that I blame for that, but that's me doing the same thing. So you have to start to have these dialogues happening. Um, and therefore, you know, books like Cynical Theories I want them to be, you know, saying, well, maybe, because any philosopher should, at the end of everything, they say, say, well, maybe, but maybe there's a different, you know, engage in that way. Um, and, that, and, you know, even the fact that it was called cynical theories, I, I didn't understand that, you know. Um, it, it, if, for instance, we decide that Derrida is an absolute relativist, I mean, he's not, but let's just decide he is for a moment, and all of his followers are absolute relativists. How is that cynicism? They seem to be implying that people were only being Derridians to get a good job at university. You know, that seemed, to me, that seemed to be the argument of the book, ultimately, that the university was now being taken over by people who didn't believe in truth just to get good jobs, <coughs> were absolute cynics about it. I don't think I've ever met anyone involved in philosophy who's like that. On, on any side, analytic, continental, whatever, you know, it's quite hard to get a position in university. You've got to do a lot of work, and being working at a university isn't particularly pleasant nowadays. Um, so I couldn't. I could not work out why they, they called it cynical theories. Um, and, you know, if, if they were just saying that relativism is cynical, cynical then, you know, Socrates was a relativist in that sense. Yeah, you know, yeah exactly. All this. So, and I don't think Socrates, you know. Look, it, it, seemed like, it seemed like they were saying, like, you know, they criticize these precious ideas, which should be criticized sometimes, but they're criticizing them too much. Therefore, yeah, exactly. they're just cynical because they criticize them too much. That seemed to be it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you can you can criticize up to this point, but then you have to stop because that threatens the whole thing. So, yeah. So, in my, my main criticism of it was I didn't think it was very well written and I didn't think it was very well researched. And ultimately, I think the idea that they're putting forward that it's just cynicism that's driving this whole thing again falls into exactly the trap we were talking about before, where you know if you're if you're someone whose identity hasn't been represented in the mainstream. This book tends, seems to be saying that if you try and represent your views in the mainstream, then you're being cynical. You know, you shut up and go back to what you're doing. Stop trying to, you know, be in university. Stop being trying to be part of the discourse. You're being cynical if you're trying to speak from a black woman's experience in university. That's cynical. You know, it's fine for me to do it, but you shouldn't do it. And that's, I, I, I'm not necessarily saying that that's their position, but that's how their book reads. And that's ultimately what we have to go with, isn't it? Mm hmm yeah, yeah, like they're like this is this is uh, this is how it can be complicated too because uh, like you said, even some of the anti woke people, cri uh, their criticisms of the woke people um, are often oversimplified too. So it's like you were said, it's like, said it's like two people, two sides yelling at each other and like mm -hmm. people throwing straw mans of the of the other sides. At each other, like yeah. I, like I, I certainly get, I certainly have my own problems with wokeness too. Like I read, um, I I've read Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility, for example, and I, I thought that was an equally terrible book as Cynical Theories to me. But that doesn't right. mean that I've even met that many people who are going around saying like, uh, I uh, like from my black woman perspective. Or like I've never even seen someone do that. I mean, the, there was the, 
it was the case that um, when I went to my local college a few years ago, there was one of my teachers who was teaching a lot of these ideas that are often criticized as wokeness, like, for example, the idea of fat phobia and that it's not actually true that it's unhealthy to be fat and someone who's morbidly obese can be just as healthy as other people. There, so there is there is that for sure, and that's the kind of thing that I disagree with. But that doesn't mean that like all of this this entire field of thought that's going on and all of the people involved with it, they're all just dumb people who are making these completely stupid points with no thought behind them all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the other thing about disagreeing with the position, like like the example you're given, giving is it still makes you think doesn't it it's still you know that's what philosophy is for and that's what you know cultural studies for all of these things it makes you think you're not just going to go this is stupid or you can do but let's hope you don't you just go okay why are they saying is that true is it not true and if you have a position where you think it's not true then you have to back that up you have to say why you think it's not true you have to write an essay about it or you have to think to yourself well i'm not going to have a knee-jerk reaction to this i'm going to think through a whether it's true or not why is it being said? Why is it being said now? What does it mean? What do all these things mean? You're not going to you're not going to say that, and you know, going with your idea that it's, that you disagree with it. You're not going to say that just to ha hold a tenured position, are you? You're going to say that because you feel that there's discrimination happening against a certain section of society. So you, as someone listening to that, has to think about that. Is there? Is there not? Can that be? Can that be changed? Uh, you know, should it be changed? All of those things. So it starts to debate, doesn't it? And so much of this seems to be shutting down debates and just going. Just stop talking. You know that's that's ridiculous. Stop talking. So you know that's that's my thing. And I think you know, and I, I do want to say this before we before we do finish. I think this happens with Marxism in in this context. You know, Marxism. It seems to me that the anti wokeism is just immediately Stalinism. It's Russia. It's totalitarianism. It's Stalinism. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and there's obviously endless debates about whether Marxism leads to Stalinism, some for, some against, whatever. But the writings of Marx are not about that. They're about analysing the capitalist economic system, um, you know, and seeing what goes on. And and his philosophy is from Hegel in lots of ways. So he's a thinker. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, wh were these people Marxists or were they not, somewhere like France in the 60s, um, the Communist Party was getting a third of the vote. It wasn't a bizarre the flirting with communism or or being part of communism. You know, I don't think it's a thing anyway, but in these terms, you know, it's it's one of the three parties. You know, if you're workers and you're downtrodden and here's a party that represents you, then you go with them. It's not you know, so often it seems when they when Derrida bizarrely or Foucault is accused of Marxism, it's like that they're part of the Russian um, Politburo from the 1980s, and they want to you know, <laughs> take all your money and you know kick you out of your house. You know, yeah. What? <laughs> a, they're not Marxists, and B, if, if they were, then they'd be theoretical Marxists, like you know, the Frankfurters, who are sitting yeah. around you talk about you know economics. They're not, you know, they're not the Politburo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny. It's it's like um, if you have a certain ideology. If anyone criticizes capitalism in any way, it's assumed that they're like this Stalinist who wants to throw people in the gulag, as, yeah, exactly. as Jordan Peterson has said before. And like, that's not necessarily what it means. Like you were saying, um, Marx was an interesting thinker in some ways. And you mentioned Hegel, too. And I've been getting more into his work lately. I've been doing a, a series on my channel about Slavoj Zizek's book about Hegel to right. attempt to get a more generalized perspective of Hegel before entering into it directly so I can understand it more right, easily. Yeah. And, and I'm a big fan of Slavoj Zizek because he's so controversial about the way yeah. he communicates and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm learning more about Hegel and it's, and it's interesting. And I've been paying more attention to some more Marxists too, like I'm I'm not I'm definitely not a Marxist, but there's some some pretty interesting intellectual Marxist like Slavoj Zizek is a Marxist, and I think he's a he's a phenomenally sophisticated and intelligent philosopher, especially when he talks about Hegel, especially because he's also uh, a Hegelian. And then there are other interesting Marxists like David Harvey, for example, mm -hmm. and he has a video series on Marx's Capital Volume One, which helped me understand it a little bit better. And like, it's a good idea to 
read books about ideas that sound dangerous and get a better understanding of it. And then like you can develop more sophisticated criticisms of it and, you know, point it, point out points that you agree with sometimes. Yeah, too. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I just think, you know, living inside whether Marx is right or wrong or, you know, right a, a bit right or a bit wrong. You know, we, we live in capitalism. Of course you've got to analyze it. You know, it'd be, it'd be insane not to analyze it. You know, that's, if you're just going along, just going, oh, this capitalism isn't it great, fantastic. You know, there's so many counterexamples to the greatness of capitalism, isn't there? You know, that you know, there's poor people. Let's just go with poor people, apart from all the other stuff. Um, you know, so so that sort of stuff, you, you do need to analyze. I mean, I I, I, was, I was fascinated. I grew up in Australia, and um, in Australia, the myth is that um, we, you know, it was set up as a penal colony, colony, obviously, by the English at first. They sent their convicts out there. And then the myth of, in Australia is that but we all got over that because we we're all terrific people. So we stopped having convicts and, you know, we, we just got on with our lives. And I, I, I stumbled upon a, a small part of Marx recently where he says, well, with the inventing of, invention of the loom, they needed a lot more wool um, in order to, you know, because they could make stuff quicker. So they needed more sheep. So rather than sending convicts to Australia, they would send sheep. Because there was more room there, so there was sheep. So that paragraph of Marx calls into question this whole narrative where they stopped sending convicts because, you know, because it was just a nice thing to do, and we didn't do that anymore. It was an economic decision, and just so, yeah. so any bits like that, you know, are fantastic. And not just Marx, anyone analysing and analysing, you can find little things like that that change the whole view of, of a particular thing. So, yeah. So this whole, this whole bizarre labelling is very odd. Yeah, yeah, like that, like what you were just saying there, it, it makes him sound favorable to capitalism. Like, well, he, I mean, like yeah, what, he, one of his his view, um, his critique of capitalism had a lot of relevant historical context that people don't often mention too. Like he was yeah. mostly criticizing the type of capitalism a source a source uh, associated with like early industrialization and like child labor and endless shifts with no break and people that like workers getting treated badly it's not yeah. it's not like capitalism as a whole is fundamentally yeah. flawed and we need to not have any capitalism yeah i mean I, some people think he's one of the sort of the great capitalist thinkers as it were because he is very good at analyzing what capitalism does and you know there, there are bits on marx of marx where he praises what's going on he thought that it was unsustainable he thought eventually, you know, because it was generating so much poverty, because it was generating so, you know, wars a little bit, but because of the inequities and all of these things, eventually it would collapse under the weight of its own contradictions and the new world would happen at that point. But he, he thought we had to go through capitalism to get to the new world. Um, and he was, he was quite, you know, interested and not necessarily negative about technological leaps that he lived through, about changes in, in things. You know, he, he was analysing this. Now, yes, he wanted a, a, eventually a utopia afterwards where, you know, we, we wouldn't have to work so much and, and um, you know, that we'd all live together and it'd all be happy happy stuff going on. Um, and some of that ended up in very political writings about tearing stuff down. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is a powerful analysis of, of the situation. And the fact that it's been narrowed to... a to the label, and a label that doesn't really fit is, you know, it's it's bad again, bad philosophy, bad theory, and so forth. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 exactly. Like that's what th that's another thing that was um uh, interesting to me. Um, I I don't know if you saw it, but that uh, famous or infamous debate, depending on how you look at it, um, between Slavoj Žižek and Jordan Peterson, and mm -hmm. And they were debating about Marxism versus capitalism. And Jordan Peterson, all he had read for the debate was the Communist Manifesto. Yes. And, Slavoj, and Slavoj Žižek has written like tons of books yeah. about a lot more than just Marxism. And like we were talking about too, uh, the Communist Manifesto is not... It's not the best. It's not the best representation of Marx as an actual intellectual yeah. thinker. Like. Um, I think I, remember, I think I remember hearing recently um, that he and Engels were like they were commissioned to write that as a pamphlet or something like that. I don't know if that's true, but 
it's not like it's it's certainly nothing like capital volume one like like i was saying that's a really dry book but it's a hell of a lot more sophisticated thought and yeah. the like i was watching um an analysis of admittedly admittedly of uh, a marxist philosopher ben burgess who i've been following more lately because i think he's um interesting he was doing an analysis of the debate with some other people and they were pointing out that you know in some cases some of the points that jordan peterson was making were refuted by marx himself either in other work or even within the communist manifesto yeah that again it's the, it's the same thing isn't it as with what happens with derrida just you know again read him why don't you read him and you know the manifesto is what it says on the tin isn't it it's a manifesto it's a political document you know written on the fly to get out there um i, I do have to say i was smiling a little bit because um I, i'm sure you know the onion newspaper um the satirical website um they had something the other day about writers being rejected it was a satirical piece and uh they had Karl marx you know saying i'd written like 15 manifestos before i finally came up with the idea of the communist manifesto and the publisher loved it so we went with that and <laughs> which I was um, yeah but yeah but uh, certainly as a representation of marxist thought it's just it's it's not you know it's a political pamphlet Put out there to try and affect change. Um, uh, the other, sorry, when we we're talking about um, books that we, we loved, and it's kind of um, relevant to this, um, there's a book I read recently, which is by David Graeber, um, called Bullshit Jobs. Um, and oh, I've heard of that, but I yeah, don't think I've read it. It's really good. It's funny, apart from anything else. It's very funny. But um, it, it sort of relates to Marx because Marx says that, you know, with all the new technology coming in, all the labor saving devices, eventually we won't have to work very much. You know, that will that will be what happens. And David Graeber goes, well, all the technology is here, all this labor saving stuff's here, but we're still working ridiculous hours. What the hell's going on? And he analyzes you know, what he calls bullshit jobs, which are people, they tend to be middle management, but uh, he actually sets the criteria that he doesn't just want to say a job is bullshit because he doesn't like it. He has to say that the people doing it know it's bullshit. And, you know, I think that is, there. Are, you know, we all know these people, and you know, often good people just going, I have no idea what, why I'm doing this job. I mean, in the office for hour after hour after hour, making Excel spreadsheets that don't get read and so forth. And so um, that's a really interesting book, which you know, takes that Marxist idea of, you know, that's what will happen to society. And Marx thought capitalism would naturally lead to that. And David Gray was saying, well, actually, capitalism, because of something about capitalism, just goes, we've still got to keep working. Everyone's still got to keep going to work. You know, we can't have not, not you know, people not working. It doesn't make sense. Um, and, you know, I, I find that fascinating. I think uh, like, this, actually, um, this actually reminds me of Derrida's Spectres of Marx in a bit, because it's almost like a specter um, uh, of, of Marx in David Graeber's book in, you, you know, that sort of that sort of critique about capitalism. And I think I think that's particular that particular aspect is related to this like North America, this typical idea in North American Western thought of the puritanical Protestant Christian work ethic of yeah. workalism and, and all that sort of thing too. And it being noble to just, just work. And uh, I've definitely where like probably everyone either has or knows someone who has at least worked bullshit jobs like that before. Like I've worked definitely bullshit jobs before like in the customer service industry or something where yeah. most of your day is spent doing pointless busy work like yes, exactly i've yeah. cleaned, like i i used to um i used to sell sell boots at a at a store and i and i would go uh, okay i'm gonna go clean my area organize a few things ask those customers if they need help uh nothing else to do um might as well just go into the back and check Facebook on my phone or some shit. And then, you know, when a manager comes over, they'll say, go and organize those shoes. Okay, well, I just did it five minutes ago. But, yeah, yeah. I'll go through it again, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and those, those jobs just they perpetuate themselves, don't they? And I, I do think, you know, because Marxism has such a weird relationship in, um, in the United States particularly don't they it's just a demon word you don't you, you just don't say it you know it's um you know, socialism as well and I think part of it is that isn't it it's seen as you know we, we must keep working we must keep striving we must keep bettering ourselves and you know the the, the systems in the United States are, are, are built on that aren't they you know healthcare you have to work hard to pay for yourself to pay for your healthcare and, and, and those sort of things so, so 
I, I think that's part of it. I, I'm also thinking I've, I've got this theory and I haven't quite done anything with it yet and I'm still thinking it through because um, I love coffee. I'm a huge fan of coffee and um, I actually wrote a novel about coffee. And, um, oh, nice. Yeah, and when I came to the United Kingdom, I um, I was worried because they had terrible coffee here and when I first came, but they, they've they actually now, because of Starbucks and Costa and all those sort of places, have really good coffee. But thinking about it, despite my love of it, I mean, coffee is the perfect capitalist drink, isn't it? You know, it keeps you going. It just keeps you going. It gets you up. It gets you into the office. You go to the office, you need to work harder and harder and harder. And, you know, it is like the third or fourth biggest commodity in the world now, coffee, I believe. And, you know, everyone in the world is being trained to drink coffee all the time. And um, I, I think that's the sort of thing where, you know, Marx would be having a field day just be going, of course they want you, you know, high on coffee. Of course they want you to keep going. You know, don't stop. You know, you've got your phone, you've got your email all the time, you've got your coffee. You can work from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. And mm-hmm. Marx has the daring idea that maybe that's not great. Maybe that's a bad thing. And so, now with, uh, and with, COVID, with COVID, too, we have the idea hey, make your home into your workplace too. And everyone yeah. can see you there all day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and the, the the dividing line between work and leisure is becoming almost impossible to, to find, isn't it? And, you know, I, I the basic thing is the more you work, the more you get paid in lots of these jobs now as well. Um, so, you know, given the choice between, you know, sitting down and having a nice dinner or or doing some more work, then you end up doing some more work. And, you know, they, they now have, you know, people being tracked in their own home to make sure they're working enough. And, you know, did we really want this? Is this what society wants? You know, and ultimately the money doesn't seem to be going to the people doing all the work, uh, which I know is a very Marxist thing to say. Um, but there does seem to be a miscalculation in here somewhere. I know it's a very banal and ordinary thing to say, isn't it? But something's gone wrong because no one seems to be enjoying it very much. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. Well, and that's- and it's interesting too because, like, <clears throat> like, People, thinkers like Foucault and Derrida are associated with being leftists and people in, on the left end of the political spectrum are like they're more prone to be like pro lockdowns and pro masks and stuff like mm-hmm. that. And then the opposite on the opposite side of the spectrum. But, you know, in, in terms of like people talk about like, um, you know, just being uh, just quarantines and uh particularly like things like curfews and people things like government tracking your personal medical data like this is that's the sort of stuff that Foucault wrote a whole book about yeah uh, that's uh I I forget which one it was called but it's a it's a book all about the surveillance state and the and the dangers of uh, government takeover of monitoring your whole lives yeah absolutely um i think discipline and punish was the one you're talking about he talks about yeah, the, discipline the, and punish yeah yeah the panopticon which was uh jeremy bentham's idea of you what what you have is you have, if you have a prison and in the middle of the prison you have a tower and a single guard can guard the entire prison because they can be up in the tower and they can just be looking and then the next step of course is you don't actually need the guard because the tower's there so people think the guard is there and this for Foucault was one metaphor for how society works, that we all police ourselves because we think the, the guard is going to come, you know, the, the man will come. And 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 so, so yeah, so that idea. Yeah, I, I don't think, I, I think Foucault would not love the quarantine. I think he, you know, he, I, he, he resisted such things a lot. I think he liked danger, as, apart from anything else. You know, he put himself in dangerous situations. I, I tend to think Derrida would, you know, calmly go about his business. I don't think he particularly liked going out very much, to be honest. I think he liked sitting at his desk and writing. So I think he'd be having a whale of a time in this. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I, for, for me, the sort of leftist position, and, you know, I do count myself as a leftist, is you do have responsibility to the other. And I think that's the ultimate thing. And and I, I think that's one of the dividing lines at the moment that, that some of the kind of far right don't believe they have responsibility to look after other people. Um, and that's the basis of a lot of their political positions. And yeah, you know, the, yeah. the last of the United States kind of exemplified that. Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, you you mentioned uh, how um, you know it's it's important to like cool things down in terms of this too. That and the and the politicization and tribalism, particularly in the U.S. And uh, I think uh, that that's Im- important too because you know. Um, I'm like, 
I certainly wear a mask when I when I go out everywhere and I've been vaccinated. I'm in, gonna get my second one and <clears throat> I'm not like going uh, I'm not like going around with people and stuff like that. Um, mm. but at the same time, I understand I understand why some people are you know, they have the impression that the lockdowns and wearing masks and stuff, especially the more sinister sounding stuff like tracking your medical data and there being a curfew and stuff the things that don't really make sense scientifically um in terms of covid i understand people having a problem with that and i don't think that people who are i don't even think that necessarily that people who are anti-vaxxers or who pe people who wear masks in protest like so some of them clearly have good intentions and I don't have the the mindset that some of even my family members have that you know like they had an it, like one of my family members had an instinct to go and punch some guy who was not <laughs> wearing a mask in a store and I thought I understand that he is putting people at risk by not wearing a mask but that doesn't make me have the urge to do violence against him I would just avoid the guy right yeah <laughs> that's right yes I mean yeah I, it's, it's it's such I mean it's it's really fascinating in the way that's you know that so much now it just seems these divisions just happen naturally don't they we almost I mean 10 years ago these didn't happen I think as much to every single issue but now they do you know you you are you are left or woke or what therefore you therefore you have all this set of beliefs. If you're on the right, you have all this set of beliefs. And um, I'm not sure where, where we go with that. You know, part of the terrifying thing about that is that has happened in the past and it's ended up in, you know, terrible wars and bloodshed, hasn't it? And you know, I know obviously for some people already it has with it with with what's going on. Um, so you kind of I, I hope we learn the lessons of history somewhat. You know, that's a huge statement to make, of course, but you know, it, if the divisions continue, then you know, I, who knows where where it ends up going? If I if I can't find a way of understanding the other person, whatever their position, or there's some you know extremists who I'm not going to, but you know the, the people in the middle, you know, it, it seems reasonable to me that most people in the middle, as it were, even to the outside edge of the middle, think they're doing the right thing, think they're the best. You know, there are obviously some malevolent actors on both sides. But most people, I think, are just trying to get by. And therefore, dialogue is is incredibly important. And, and one of the things about Derrida, and we you know probably should finish on Derrida, but he he, he loved the idea of dialogue. And lots of his later work is actually dialogue with people, because as with what we're doing now, when you have a dialogue, you know, you new ideas come out of it, new thoughts come out of it. New you know, both of us are having thoughts that we probably haven't had if we didn't have this conversation. You know, dialogue does that, doesn't it? It produces things. Um, and it seems at the moment with everyone taking their you know, very unnuanced positions. What's not happening is some combination of those positions being put forward. And those, you can't really decide to put those positions forward. You can decide to try and make them happen. But the stuff that I think will perhaps lead us out of all these messes we're in at the moment um, is by people talking to each other and coming up with third ways. And that's not going to happen with people separated. So that yeah, was all yeah. very moving and, you know, <laughs> cope for the future sort of stuff. Um, but, you yeah, know, that's. What should end on a bit of hope for the future? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well said. Yeah, I to I totally agree. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, right. we can end it here. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks so much again for talking to me. And awesome. uh, and, and I'd love to talk to you again about uh, you know, about uh, similar philosophical topics or or anything any anything related to philosophy. I, I'm I don't have a degree in philosophy, but I'm just uh, I'm just I study it all the time, and I'm obsessed. Right. With so I love I love talking about it and yeah, so do I. Yeah. learning about it. So yeah. Uh, yeah, and any 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 idea you have about a, a chat for any philosophical topic, I'd love to do that. That'd and, be fantastic, uh, definitely um, up for because I love talking about it too. And I also don't have a degree in philosophy, so you know. We... <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Yeah, one, one thing: yeah. If, you, if, you, if you do manage to understand Hegel, I'd really love you to explain it because Hegel, I just I can't understand. <laughs> yeah, we should we should, uh, we should talk about we should talk about Hegel. Yeah, maybe, maybe sometime, maybe sometime, maybe next time uh, if you right, want. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Absolutely. sure. Awesome. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Now I do have to. I'm contractually obliged by my publisher to hold up my book again. So. Okay. Yeah, to check out his book and event perhaps, and and I'll uh, 
I'll include a link for that in the description of this as well. Very quickly over Hegel. I pretend I know Hegel in the book. <laughs> yeah, he's well, really, he's, really complex and difficult to understand. Yeah, he's too difficult. So I, I just whip past him and go, Hegel, he's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'll just uh, say all the stuff I like to say at the end of my videos here, um, and then you can uh, give any last words if you want to there. So, um, thanks to all of those uh, those of you who watched this. I hope you found it as interesting as we did, and thanks to those of you who subscribed to the channel. Please click the like button on the video and share this everywhere, and try to inform people that they're misinformed about postmodernism and thinkers like Derrida and Foucault and uh, look forward to our next chats too. Um, got a podcast coming up this weekend with uh, my friends Dusty and Parker and we're going to start talking about Stephen King's Dark Tower series with the first one, The Gunslinger. And also um, thanks especially to those of you who subscribe to my Patreon page, and I'll include include the link of that in the description for this video as well. And like I always say, I love you all. Keep being the tiny beam of light that shines through the almost impenetrable darkness in the universe. And most importantly, always remember this: the funk cures all. And study thinkers like Derrida and Foucault, and check out Peter's book, an event perhaps, and study people you agree with and people you disagree with, even if their thoughts scare you. All right. So anything else uh, to say there before we yes. close it off there, Peter? Absolutely no way I can follow that. So I'm not going to. Um, do do look me up on Twitter because I do love chatting about this stuff. But yeah, what, what was it? The funk will what will solve it the all? Funk, the funk cures all. The funk cures all. That's yes. I'm, I'm going to leave on that. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank Thanks a lot for talking, yeah. man. And I hope to talk to you again. Okay. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye.